our lust. Some of us in here today are watching and listening online. We have a sin inclination for sexual immorality. We can't control ourselves. We have to have sexual partners, multiple sexual partners, sexual activity outside of marriage. It is something that we lack so much control in that we find ourselves in and out of relationships or in and out of sexual encounters with people that we're not married to. And we find this repetition over and over again. We use him or we use her, and then we get what we want from them. We get aroused, we do our thing, and then we move on. Or we give up our sexuality to the person, and we think that they want to be committed to us, but then when we find out they were just playing with us, we're heartbroken. And what we find ourselves in is we keep repeating this cycle like the fruit fly, going to the edge, trying to get a taste, but you fall in. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to look at King David for a moment when we talk about sexual temptation. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. Somebody say problem number one. Problem number one, he's a king. He's supposed to be at war, but he sent his homies instead of going out to fight for themselves. He was out of position out of what his purpose was. A lot of times if you're having sexual problems and you're having sexual temptation, you're out of position of what God's will is for your life. You are substituting a man or a woman or some type of relationship or some sexual encounter. It is a substitute to try to satisfy a deep, unmet need within yourself. A lot of people who are overtly sexually promiscuous, it's not that they're whorish. It's not that they want to necessarily be that way. They haven't processed psychologically and emotionally and spiritually some unmet need of being wanted or being accepted, probably from their childhood. So they vicariously carry it out through multiple sexual encounters, trying to get that euphoric feeling of me being wanted. King David had a sex problem. He was a man after God's own heart, but he had a sex problem. And his son had a sex problem after him, King Solomon. King Solomon, his son, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Somebody say, that's a whole... Okay, can't say it. Let's keep going. In the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reba. However, David stayed where, church? Behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, what you resting for? You ain't doing nothing. That's number two. When you're out of position, oftentimes you get lazy and complacent. See, the old saying goes, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. I used to wonder what that meant. Is the devil really in there with like goggles on and like, yeah, is the devil taking woodshop class? Like what is the devil doing? <laughs> but, <laughs> Paul, but the same. But the saying goes that way. And what, what, the, what the Bible wants us to understand is that oftentimes when we're having um, immoral sexual encounters, right? Well, even, when, even if we're masturbating to pornography or something like that, we're out of position, out of God's will for our lives, meaning we're not focused and we're not in the place where God wants us to be. And we're being complacent. We are not motivated to go forward in God's purposes. So what happens is you get lazy and you get complacent and then you're just chilling. And if you're chilling and you ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing, you'll find something to get into. So David took a nap from doing nothing. And when he woke up from his nap from doing nothing, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife, somebody say she was married, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Now, when we talk about the sweet pool of destruction when it comes to sex, <clears throat> one thing that sin doesn't tell us is the horrible consequences of the reality of the fact that when we get tempted to do sexual sin, we find ourselves getting this chemical release from our brains, okay? God designed our body so that when we are aroused, or when we have sexual intercourse, our brains release a chemical that creates an emotional attachment 
to what caused that emotion, I'm sorry, what caused that sexual encounter. So for example, if you have a problem with masturbating to pornography, right, you're getting fixated with pixels on a screen, two-dimensional figures that are not real. And what happens is if you had create a habit of that, if it's magazines or a screen, you will have trained your body and your psyche to get aroused to two-dimensional figures. It is a psychological mind trip. It's a trap that sin doesn't tell you the whole story. You only get that euphoric feeling, but you don't understand the emotional and psychological connection you have, and then you feel like you can't stop. It's like a drug at that point, because you want that chemical release again. Again, it's trying to meet an unmet need, so you're self-medicating with sexual encounters, whether it's self-sex through masturbation or sex with a partner, someone that you found or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or somebody you met at some event. Now, King David, he had a sex problem. He was a man after God's own heart. He was a worship leader. He was a warrior. He was a king. And he had this time on his hands. He was out of position of God's will for his life. He saw something and he wanted to use his power and say, yeah, I see her. I see that. I want that. Now, he knew this was wrong. But like the fruit flies, King David was like, I know God don't like this, but I'm the king. Anytime you start a sentence to yourself saying, I know God don't like this, but you already have told yourself the fruit fly, lie. I, I got tongue tied. <laughs> Let me try it again on this side, Charlie. You've told yourself the fruit fly, lie. Did I get it, Jadonna? I tried. So the fruit fly, lie is that God's going to make an exception for you. <laughs> See, can, can we put the uh, fruit fly image, uh, the sweet pool of destruction mug on the screen? Y'all can judge me later. These things are annoying. So these little things bought into the lie that I see these other things have fallen in there and they've been killed but gravity's going to make an exception for me. Can I tell y'all something? Can I, Janita, don't, don't judge me. But <laughs> Let me tell y'all something I've been doing. This is bad. I know, Joe. Don't, don't get mad. I stand by the bar, and I see them little fruit flies playing with, they playing with sin. They, they playing with it. So you, you ever been at a pool party, and like somebody standing on the edge of the pool, you just shove them in? I've been doing that with them though, so like, <laughs> I get next to them and I go, and I just, ah, like I blow them in there and I just, I'm sorry. <clears throat> That's, that has nothing to do with the sermon, it's just, I'm just tired of these bugs in my house. <clears throat> okay, back to the sermon. The fruit, the fruit fly lie is gravity is going to make an exception for me. The lie for you is God's going to make an exception for me. God's law doesn't apply to me because I asked God to forgive me before I did it. Or God knows my heart and, you know, God going to help me fix this thing later. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. We're still talking about the sexual sweet pool of destruction that some of us find ourselves in. Proverbs chapter 5 says, For the lips of an immoral woman are what? I told you I use honey in my little mug to get the fruit flies, right? Now, the Bible is not gender biased. The lips of an immoral man are also sweet as honey. Ladies, you don't have to amen. I know some of these dudes out here got game. Now, some of the guys are clapping that they got game. Okay, Casanova. The lips of an immoral man or woman can be there's an old R&B song from the 90s. Give me that honey love. <clears throat> Sorry. Give me that honey love. All right, so there's this honey temptation, right? Some people can spit some game so sweet that it tastes so good to you. It sounds so good to you. And the Bible says the immoral woman's mouth is smoother than oil. Smooth. Smooth. Somebody say but. 
That's a big but. But in the end, she is as bitter as what? Poison. There's all kinds of R&B songs in this verse. As dangerous as a double-edged sword. Brothers and sisters, have you ever entertained the conversation of someone who was sweet and smooth in the beginning, but poisonous and dangerous in the end? What you need to understand is that sin got gain. And you have a sin inclination. You have a spiritual taste bud for a certain type of person, a certain type of temptation. And the devil and your sinful nature tag team on you to get you caught up in the sweet pool of destruction. Let's get the mug back on the screen with the fruit flies. Just like the fruit flies hang around the edge. All right, Pastor Devin, I'm just having sex with him. It's just a little fun. Ain't nothing really going to happen. We're using protection. Is there a condom for your heart? I didn't know they made condoms for hearts. Is there a day after pill for your soul? See, you only think about the physical consequences, but you aren't thinking about the spiritual and the psychological and the emotional consequences. That's the lie of the sweet pool of destruction. Focus point. If you don't remember anything else we talk about today, ladies and gentlemen, you need to remember that temptation to sin comes in many ways, but there's a bitter price in the end to pay. There's three types of sweet pools of destruction. We talked about the first one. It's sexual or lust. The second one is financial or money. Let's talk about it. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerai, of the tribe of Judah. God got upset with all the people in the community because one man took some plunder that he wasn't supposed to. We're going somewhere. When you make poor financial choices, you think it only affects you. When you are a slave to the shopping, some of us swipe so much. The swipe, you know, it ain't even uncommon for the cashier to lean over and say, Nah, something wrong with your, your, your chip reader. Do it again. No, something wrong with your credit. What happens is we find ourselves self-medicating once again, just like the person with the sexual sweet pool of destruction. If you have the financial sweet pool of destruction, you feel good when you swipe that card. You feel good when you buy that stuff you know you can't afford. You feel good when you borrow that money from the credit card lender, but you know you can't afford to pay it back. But in the moment, you're not thinking about the financial duress you're going to put on yourself and your family. You're thinking about how it makes you feel. Those shoes make you feel good, brothers. I ain't hating on nobody, but if you got $300 shoes on your feet, your savings account should be super dope. If you got money for tents and rims and all this other kind of stuff, like, like the, this is the stuff I'm talking about. We get so caught up in materialism because we really, we really are insecure. Can I just go there? I'm going to do it anyway. A lot of us are insecure, so we, we're insecure about who we are, so we need people to affirm us by saying, ooh, girl, them shoes look nice. Thank you. It's only going to set me back my whole rent for the month, but thank you so much. We're so insecure that we get stuff to make us feel better. Can we get the fruit flies back on the screen? The lie of the fruit fly was that they believed that this would make them feel better. Now, 
You may say, Pastor, these fruit flies are dumb. They might say you dumb. If the fruit fly could come up here and speak English, they might have some words for you too. Because you do the same thing they're doing. Fruit flies' life expectancies are very short, so they don't have much to live for anyway. So they take a chance. Unlike a fruit fly, you and I have a lot to live for, but we still take the same type of chance. So when we talk about the financial sweet pool of destruction, let's go back to Joshua chapter 7. I need you to understand that the financial decisions you make impact your family negatively when you are frivolously spending because you're trying to meet some unmet need from your past. Maybe you weren't cool. Maybe you were ashy. Maybe you got picked on. Maybe you were overweight. Maybe you were underweight. Maybe your teeth weren't straight. I don't know what it was, but now that you're an adult, you feel like you have to show people how fresh and clean you are. Ain't nobody dope as me, I dress so fresh and clean. Don't you think I'm so sexy, I dress so fresh. That joint is tight. That song is still tight. But Lucia's got Gator Belts and Patty Melts and Monte Carlo. Okay, so uh, that's, that's Outcast. It's a rap group. from okay. Joshua chapter 7. We got to get so fresh and so clean. There, there's another song. <laughs> there, there's a rap group. Uh, they're not together anymore. Birdman and Manny Fresh. They're called Big Timers. Right? <laughs> they had one of the most ignorant hooks. <laughs> Can't pay my rent, but my money's spent. But that's okay, because I'm going to shine. I'm, I can fly. I don't remember those. They had the Gilligan's Island music. We like, yeah, we ignorant. We spending money. Yeah, we ignorant. We spending money. <clears throat> now back to our regularly scheduled sermon already in progress. Joshua chapter seven, verse four. Watch the consequences of Achan's bad financial decision. Watch. He took that stuff that the Lord said destroy. He took it and kept it. Watch what happened. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent to go fight this army, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear as this turn of events and their courage melted away. Now, for the sake of time, I won't go through all the other verses, but you must understand <laughs> if you, if on your own time, go look at verses two through two, two and three. The Israelites are like, oh, it's only a couple thousand of them. We just need three thousand men. We can kill them. They easy. They should have been able to beat so, the soldiers of Ai easily, but the Lord was not fighting with them. In our praise and worship time, we we sang a song called "This Is How I Fight My Battles." We're talking about worship. We're talking about faith. And what I told y'all in our worship set was this. This is what I was alluding to. The Lord is at the battlefield ready to fight your battle, but your faith must meet him at the fight at the battlefield. God has... You have human will. In other words, God gives you and I this space to make decisions. And then he has his sovereign will. Well, at the end of the day, whether you're obedient or not, his purposes will still prevail. For example, I've, I've had the, the sad privilege of officiating funerals for young people. I say sad because I, I hate when I'm officiating a funeral for somebody who's younger than me. We probably made some poor choices in this community and is no longer with us. But at that person's funeral, hundreds of teenagers or young people will get saved. If that person had an assignment on his or her life to lead 200 people to Jesus, and that person was disobedient, them 200 would get saved at your funeral. See, God will work it out like pieces on a chessboard within your human will to fulfill his sovereign will. God's will will be done. Whether you are willing or unwilling, his will will be done. 
The question is, will you comply with his will or will you have to be used in spite of your obedience so his will will be done? God wanted to teach the children of Israel a lesson that you got somebody in your camp you can't trust. Somebody who got sticky fingers. Somebody who's stealing. Somebody who holds stuff they ain't supposed to be holding. Somebody who has wealth that they ain't supposed to be having. Somebody that has stuff, materialistic stuff for themselves and they are bringing drama on your family. What about you? What stuff have you swiped that has brought debt on your family? When we go to bury you, we can't even afford to pay for the funeral. No savings account, no life insurance, but your closet full of stuff. You leave such a burden on your family members who want to bury you, but now they got to go raise money on Kickstarter or GoFundMe to raise money just to put you in the ground. This is a tough talk. Stay with me. I still love you. But you need to hear this. We have got to make better financial decisions. Because it ain't just about that euphoric feeling you feel when you swipe or when you spin. You got to think about your future. Think about your kid's future. Aiken was thinking about himself. He didn't think about people getting killed going down the slope. 36 people getting killed. Let's see what happens as we wrap up on Aiken. Joshua chapter 7 verse 20. They pull Aiken up. They say, yo, we've been praying, man. The Lord said it's you. Look at Aiken. It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much. Have you ever seen the sale sign in the mall? I want it so much. I want it so much. Some of us... Some of us are like the, the little mall kiosk people. They be looking, they be waiting for us. Oh, there she go, there she go. Hey, you want to try this lotion? Lotion, try the lotion. You know, like, like they know you're going to come over there and try it, and then you're going to buy it. Some of us are not window shoppers. We are impulsive shoppers. We were not going to spend that money, but when we went to the mall, we got sucked into the impulse of buying things that we know we don't need. So... He said, yo, I saw them silver coins, bro. I saw that robe from Babylon, Slim. That bar of gold was like a pound. I wanted that junk so much that I took them. They're hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. Now, what happened later, I'll spare you the gory details for the sake of time, but if you read this story on your own, you'll see that his whole family got killed. All his animals, all his stuff got burned. First, he and his family were stoned to death, and then they were burned. That's how gangster God used to deal with sin back in the day. Aren't you glad we're into the new covenant and we got grace now? We're not under the Old Testament Mosaic law. We're under the new covenant, the grace. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God doesn't deal with sin the same way he used to. God used to go gangster in the Old Testament. You thought mafia, mobsters was gangster. When you, when you turned your back on God and did something like that, God made an example out of you in the Old Testament sometimes. He still did it out of love, but God is so holy, he can't tolerate sin. So God ain't switched up. He's just using a new way to show his love, and it's through grace by accepting his son as your Lord and Savior. Now, what's the moral of this story, Pastor? Because you said we got three. This is only number two. Well... The moral is, think before you spend. Think before you bring items in your house. Do you know that as soon as you buy a new car, it loses value as soon as you drive it off the lot? I was listening to Jay-Z's album, 444, or 444, however you want to say it. And Jay's dropping a lot of gems about investing in financial wealth. He talked about how he bought this painting for a million and now it's worth $2 million. And when Blue Ivy's an adult, it's going to be worth $8 million. And he's talking about Instagram rappers who be showing all their money on Instagram and how they flashing it like, that's what's up. He's like, where I'm at now on this level, we don't even call that money. What I'm saying is the sweet pool of destruction. Let's get the, the image of the uh, fruit flies back on the screen. The, the, the sweet pool of destruction says, 
Agak, oke. Okay. <coughs> Today is Friday. I just got paid. Let's see how little I can have left by Monday. Not about what I can put in savings, not about me setting up a life insurance policy because I'm going to die one day and I don't want my family struggling. For some of us, we need to take out a simple life insurance policy, $30 a month even, so that when we die, we can leave our kids something. Leave them $25,000, leave them $50,000. Give them something to help them bury you and move on and get their own house or help their own family. We have to stop thinking like the fruit fly. What can I get right now? What can I get right now? What, 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 what can I get right now? Just for me, j j just for me. Like we make a mixtape about self. Our wealth is not just for us to keep for ourselves. It's so we can bless our families, amen? amen. Last one. Last one. Something like, thank God. Let's wrap this up. This is making me very uncomfortable. You're comparing me to a fruit fly. If the wings fit. Vocational or egotistical? Let's just say ambition. This is the last one. This is the last sweet pool of destruction we'll talk about for today. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 through 10. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Verse 10. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one. The power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. So this guy was not a Christian. He was a magician, right? Voila! <laughs> you know, he's one of them type dudes. Watch what happened to him, though. He was used to the spotlight, and he was used to impressing people with tricks. Somebody say tricks. We'll come back to that. Let's skip down to Acts chapter 8, verse 18. Watch what happens. When Simon the sorcerer saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. <laughs> Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. He wasn't focused on helping people get saved. He wanted the spotlight for himself so that he could get the stage. It wasn't about people getting saved, it was about him getting the stage. When we talk about this third sweet pool of destruction, we said it's egotistical or vocational or ambition. Some of us want to be elevated in our jobs, but not for the right reasons. We want the promotion, but not for the right reasons. We want the platform, but not for the right reasons. We want more social media followers, but not for the right reasons. We want to be the leader or the manager or the supervisor, but it's not for the right reasons. It's not to help others. It's not so you can help other people know who Jesus Christ is. It's not so that you can be a light in a dark place. It's so that the light can be shining on you so you can get all the accolades. Simon the sorcerer didn't give a rip about people's souls being saved. Simon the sorcerer wanted to be the man because the disciples or the apostles were walking in his town by the power of the Holy Spirit healing people. He said, oh, all I could do is pull rabbits out, man. All I can do is hocus pocus. Y'all actually healing people? Hey, how much that joint costs? My question to you is, what are you willing to do? Or how much are you willing to sell out so that you can get the accolades? What would you do to get promoted? What would you do to be on celebrity status? Some people humiliate themselves on reality TV shows just to be famous. There's this show called Married at First Sight. I'm hearing the murmurs. If you're not familiar with the show Married at First Sight, you can probably get it from the title. But Married at First Sight is basically two people who never met before, met with these, psycho these psychologists, the divorce expert. I didn't know you could get a degree in that. Um, all these people that counsel them and psychoanalyze them, and they pick a spouse for you, and you don't meet the spouse until y'all walk down the aisle. Most of the marriages don't work, but they're in like their fifth season. Like, 
Walk. Fruit fly. Hello. Oh, oh. Oh, season five is mine. You know, Christians like to rhyme the, um, the, the theme of the year, you know. Season five is mine. Season six, I'm in the mix. This is my year. No. So <laughs> the point I'm making is when we do things, like on that reality TV show, the sad thing is some of the people that get married really want to be married, but some people just want to promote themselves, get more social media followers. They ain't really thinking about marrying you. What would you be willing to do to get more accolades? Well, Simon the sorcerer thought he could buy the Holy Spirit. Let's see what happens. Verse 20, but Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your what? Whew. The Bible says from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't have to tell me what's in your heart. I know by what you say. This dude was talking all this stuff because he wanted to be famous again. I was Simon the sorcerer. People came from all over around calling me the great one. And then the disciples came in town one day, laying hands on people, driving out demons. And no one came to my buddy show anymore. No one wanted to see me call sparks to fly for my little stick. I said, I need to get a new act. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. <laughs> he probably didn't talk like that. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say ambition. There's an old commercial. What would you do for a Klondike bar? Do y'all remember that? What would you do for a little bit of praise? What would you do? What would you do for a hundred more social media followers? What would you do for a thousand social media followers? What would you do? to be recognized when you walk in any place in your neighborhood. Verse 21, Peter said, you can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Somebody say captive. Praise team, let's go. Let's wrap it up because I want to just worship the Lord for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12, this is the last verse for the day. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Somebody say trips us up. Sin can get you tripped up and caught up. We just read what Peter said in Acts chapter 8. He said, you're held captive by sin. Some of us keep making these same poor choices. We keep dibbling, dabbling, almost going into the sweet pool of destruction, we, you know, playing around with sin, trying to see if we can get a taste without falling in. We do that because sin has a certain hold on us. And it's not that we can't get free. Whew. We don't have the faith to get free. I told you, this is how I fight my battles. God is on the battlefield fighting. The Bible says that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. He prays in heaven for me and you on a regular basis. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. You got the tools, you got the God, but you don't got the faith. This is a co-op fight. This is a tag team effort. I love professional wrestling. Pay-per-view's coming on today. I'm going to enjoy watching it. This is a tag team match. God is on the battlefield trying to help you fight the temptations of sweet pool of destruction, the financial temptations, the egotistical vocational temptation, the sexual temptation, but you don't believe that you can win, so you don't show up. Janali put something amazing on Instagram. She had no idea I would use it in this sermon, but here it goes. Janali posted on Instagram this picture of a bus that said, battles are not won on the sidelines. Did y'all hear that? 
Battles are not won on the sidelines. This is not one of those things where you can just sit and say, y'all go ahead and y'all, y'all do everything and it's going to work out for me. I used to make fun of Ron Brown when the Chicago Bulls were uh, just crushing in the playoffs. I think his name was Ron Brown, number zero, Chicago Bulls. Sorry, Ron, if you're watching. But I used to laugh at him because he got five championship rings and never played in the playoffs. He was a third string Chicago Bulls player in the era of Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Dennis Rodman. He didn't need to get in the game, but he got the rings. This is not one of those moments, church. You are not going to win this battle by you sitting off on the sidelines saying, woe is me, God, I don't know if I can make it. Lord, I I can't beat this sexual temptation. God, I can't beat this financial temptation. Lord, I I, I, I got an ego. I got these ambitions. Lord, you just got to do it all by yourself. No, 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 no. The Lord is there battling and interceding for you. That's why you're still alive. That's why you haven't died in your sin. But if you want to be victorious in life and win, you have to start having more faith to believe that the Lord can get you out of that sin that so easily trips you up, that sin that so easily messes you up, that slows you down. You got to have enough faith, as the verse says, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, let us run with endurance. Somebody say endurance. That means it ain't going to be quick. This ain't no sprint. This is a marathon. Every day you got to wake up and die to that flesh. Every day you got to wake up and die to the temptation to go back to that sweet pool of destruction, to go back to that boyfriend, to go back to that girlfriend, to go back to that frivolous spending, to go back to trying to get your ego boosted, to go back to you trying to get stuff by illegitimate means so that you can be popular. You got to die to that every day and say, Lord, I surrender my will to yours because I'm not going to give into the fruit fly lie thinking that I can get close and not fall in. This is how I fight my battles. My faith must meet my Lord fighting for me. Do you believe that God can deliver you from your sin? Do you believe that God has the power to help you overcome? Do you believe that if you walk in obedience, it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be difficult, but it's going to require endurance to finish? People who win marathons don't whine and complain about the pain. They're running to get the prize. Verse 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. When the desire or the temptation comes in your heart or your conscience to go back to that sexual sin, to go back to that financial sin, to go back to that egotistical, ambitious sin, you got to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. I tell people all the time, I recommend you get your phone. It's a smartphone. Let's get smart with it. Go to Google and get a whole bunch of scriptures, copy and paste them and put them in a notes app or some type of document on your phone that you can remind yourself of what God says about you, of what God's best for you when it comes to your sexual purity, of God's best for you for your future spouse, of God's best for you in your finances and your wealth. What does the book of Proverbs say about wealth? What does the Bible say about my ego? I should be humble like my Lord and the Lord will exalt me in due season. I don't have to try to manipulate and finagle my way into illegitimate means of getting accepted or getting status quo. I can walk by faith and not by sight. You got to have them scriptures ready so when that temptation comes, you can pull out God's text message and say, what's up, Lord? What you talking about? This is how I fight my battles. It's not just a song that we sang earlier. It's a lifestyle choice. Say, Pastor, how can I apply this message to my life? How can I take this one step further in my spiritual journey? Here's how. Identify the number one temptation in your life that takes your focus from God and get away from it now. Now. Somebody say now. All throughout this message, you were thinking about somebody. I know you were. You were thinking about some things. I know you were. You know what this is. Don't lie. Don't get amnesia now that you see it on the screen. Who or what do you need to get away from now? Because when you do it now, read it backwards. You've already won. This is how you fight your battles. Let's stand to our feet. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we come before you and we just ask that you would help us to apply this difficult message to our lives. This is easier said than done, but it is possible to live a lifestyle that your will be done. 
Help us, Lord God, not to be slaves to sin. Help us, Lord God, not to give into the lie of the fruit fly. Help us not to give into the impulse of the sweet pool of destruction. Help us, Lord God, to walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's take a moment.